Hello everyone watching and everyone joining us from Harmon Park in Kearney. I'm your host Kim Todd. We are so glad you could join us for an hour of answering your gardening questions on Backyard Farmer. Unfortunately, this is a taped show, so we cannot take your phone calls. However, you can always send us an email. That address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us which part of the state you are from. Give us as much information as possible so we can answer your question properly. And of course, you can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, all that good stuff, or ask your local garden center professional if we can't help you. We're gonna start with samples, and Dennis is sitting in the bug chair. That is not an insect. No, but I do have a tick on me as well. Um, <laughs> this is a bull snake. It's the most common snake in Nebraska, found in all 93 counties. Um, the color can be dark or light. It's the only snake with a pointed nose that digs after moles and gophers. So it's the only snake in the state that could dig its own hole. So if you say it's a snake hole, you're saying it's a bull snake hole. Their teeth are less than an eighth of an inch to carry no germs and viruses to people, but they eat over a dozen mice and rats a week. 100% beneficial, found statewide, and they grow to almost a little over eight foot. That makes them the largest snake in the state by over two foot. Nothing else in the state gets near six foot. And what is its name? I don't name it. It has electronic tag in it. So. <laughs> In other words, he does not really like his snakes. He doesn't give them names. I, right. They're conservation for conservation easement. So. All right. Thank you, Dennis. And all of you afraid of snakes know he's not going to let it go. I all wouldn't right. do that to the snake. <laughs> all right, Bill, what did, you, uh, what did you find, and why is that such a pathetic sample in comparison yeah. to the snake? I'm sorry. I uh, sat on my sample today, so it kind of <laughs> shrunk a little bit. But uh, this is the time of year where we're going to start to see our uh, annual grassy weeds starting to come up. So these are just crab grasses. Uh, this one is from my yard. And uh, the one here on my left hand is from right here in Harmon Park on an area where there was no grass. And so in these bare areas, we're going to see that the, the annual grassy weeds have started to, uh, to grow a little earlier and so they're a lot more developed. You can see this one's got several leaves on it. Uh, and then these are called tillers, which are kind of like, looks like shoots coming off of this crown, the growing point of this uh, annual grass, versus the one that had some more competition in my yard, a little bit slower to get going. I don't use a pre-emergence herbicide in my yard because I don't get very much crabgrass normally, and um, so I don't really have uh, uh, that big of crabgrass. So this is the size we want to control before we get those tillers, up to about five leaves. If we're, once we get past five leaves and we get to these bigger ones, they're really going to be uh, difficult to selectively control. Uh, there's different products out there that can work on these pretty well. Even uh, the pre-emergence herbicide uh, Dithopur uh, can even kill these weeds uh, post when they're small. But um, when it get big, we're going to have problems with uh, levels of control. And so you catch it early and then make that application if you traditionally have an issue with uh, crabgrass. A new product, Roundup for lawn, Lawns, will kill this. But just be careful and make sure you get the Roundup for Lawns because that's not actually Roundup. So if you're going to use that product, make sure you look closely at that label. And you don't want to put down actual Roundup on your lawn or you will kill everything. All right. Thank you, Bill. Amy, what? <laughs> well, if you look at it, it looks really healthy, right? <laughs> so I'm finally getting around to planting my garden. And so this is a pepper trains plant that I had. And I was ready to throw them in the ground until I pulled them out. And some of the potting soil came off. And if you take a look on his little stem here, we're brown and thin. This is pythium, which is a root and stem disease. Um, very common to find. <clears throat> it's favored by wet soils. And for me, it was wet because all my transplants get watered once a week. So I added a lot of water to the bottom of the container and cool conditions. And with our weather conditions the way it has been, my house was actually fairly cool, which I want to get a nice thick stem anyway, but I was sitting around that 50 to 60 degree temperature and so favorable for pythium to develop. Now, if I, soil hadn't knocked off below this point, I wouldn't have known that. And so if I would have planted this little pepper in about a week or two when we start getting really hot and he's out there and competing for water, he would easily just flop over and die. And so if you see your pepper plants or any of your new transplants start doing that, I would really take some time and take a look to see if you have any root rot and stem rot going on. You're going to find it in pretty much any plant material, whether you start your own or you buy. 
um, from a reputable nursery. These things are hard to avoid. They're just naturally going to be occurring in the soil mix uh, that they're using. And when the conditions are right, they're going to attack these little plants. So, but this is Pythium, Instant Rod, and Pepper. All right. Thank you, Amy. Good luck with the rest of the garden. Thanks. Okay, Elizabeth, some lovely samples. Some lovely samples that you can actually eat if you wait long enough. Uh, so what I have is I have a couple of fruits that are the tree fruits that we have. I have both a mulberry and a choke cherry. And the way to tell the difference, if we start with the choke cherry, if you look really closely on the petiole of the leaf, right in here, there's two little the glandular knobs is what they are, but two little dots on that petiole. And what that does is that signifies that that is indeed a choke cherry. Now, if you look at some of the fruits, they didn't have a really good fill. We're kind of touch and go here on some of these, so either they didn't pollinate well or maybe the birds have already gotten them. But with the choke cherry, as you wait until they turn that purpley kind of color, you go ahead and you use them at that point in time. They're a stone fruit, um, so you're not going to get a lot of fruit or a lot of flesh for your work, uh, so it's going to take quite a bit. They are very tart. Um, so it's going to take a lot of sugar if you want to make some jelly out of those guys. The other one is super fun. This is a mulberry and mulberries are cool for several different reasons. Um, they have both male and female trees. So if you're lucky enough to get a male tree, uh, then you don't have the fruit. So those are good ones to have over the top of the driveway and things like that. If you get the female one, they're going to produce these lovely berries. There's the white and then there's the purple. And you'll know when the purple are ripe because you're going to find the bird splats and the raccoon poop and all that stuff that's bright purple too at that point in time. One way to know the mulberry is it looks like there's pinking shears that um, somebody cut this leaf out very nicely. The kicker with mulberry is not all the leaves are the same. So some of them are going to have sinuses, they're going to look like mittens, they're going to look like fine fingers. Um, so each tree or even each branch or leaf is going to be different. So that's where it makes it a little bit difficult. But if it looks really glossy, it looks like somebody took pinking shears to it. Um, that's how we know that we have a mulberry. And like I said, just a little bit more time, let them get to that purple color. And uh, hopefully within a month or so, you'll be ready to eat some of these. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. And just so you know, those are along my driveway. So that gives you a notion of what my landscape looks like. If it grows, it stays. All right, Dennis, you get the first picture question. We actually okay. had two or three people ask us about this, and you said you saw this on campus as yeah, well. Yeah, on city campus uh, when I was not there for yeah. a couple of days. This is a fox squirrel. We have what we call melanistic fox squirrels in a good part of the state, and it's just a mutation uh, like m uh, albinism, but they're black. Um, they're no, no different species, but this one has mange. And we're seeing more and more squirrels in areas where people feed the squirrels or allow the squirrel population to get high. Um, they naturally get mange, and that helps keep the population down. Um, so if you're feeding them, you might see more of this mange. And what happens when it gets real hot or it gets cold, because they have mange and they've lost their fur, they'll probably succumb. And that's nature's way of selecting and lowering the population. All right, thank you, Dennis. Okay, Bill, this is a Papillion homeowner, two-year construction. Uh, wondering about the damage to the lawn. Is it critters, grubs, over-fertilized? He has aerated, uh, he overseeded with 95% fescue, 5% bluegrass, did grub control. He did do gypsum in the spring. He yep. does say this is the south side of his house. Well, one thing is I wouldn't recommend ever using a gypsum product um, for most of our lawns because we don't really have that low of pH in our soil, so let's just put that out there. But this is uh, none of those pests you just asked about. This is uh, Ascochyta leaf blight. This is something that we have saw explode across eastern Nebraska over the Memorial Day weekend. It's a disease that um, it hits the tips of the, uh, the leaves and you'll see they'll start to kind of have these little spots and then the, the whole tip will then die out from the top. It gets a straw color appearance and then it'll eventually thin out and the leaves will die all the way back down to their growing point called the crown. Um, it's nothing we can do uh, from, for it except for keep our lawns uh, well watered but not over watered. If you're over watered or like we were in Memorial Day, we had that flash drought in the eastern half of the state, 100 degree temperatures, very dry, very windy, uh, sunny, and uh, this disease went crazy. If you mowed during that drought, you can probably see the uh, mower tracks through your lawns. Um, nothing we can spray now, damage has been done, nothing really can even spray in future springs. It just happens when we go from cold and wet to hot and dry really rapidly. And luckily it doesn't hurt the crown and in about 10 days it will be mowed out and you won't have this problem anymore. But it's, it's a real pain in the butt right now, so. All right, thanks Bill. 
Amy, uh, uh -huh. this is a viewer who has English roses. She has a couple of them. And they have this yellowing with green veins. Uh, she does, they're in Hastings. She says they've had a fair amount of rain. She has fertilized. Her follow-up a week or 10 days later was they're still yellow like this, disease if, or fertility. If they're still yellow, I would really probably look at re-fertilizing to me. With that really dark green vein might be a little bit of nitrogen deficiency, maybe a little bit of iron chlorosis in there. You said you fertilized. But with all these wonderful rains that we had, we're seeing a lot of that nitrogen that we may have applied around our ornamental plants getting pushed down and leaching down into that soil profile. And that plant isn't able to uptake it anymore. So I would try another fertilizer um, application. If that doesn't work and you're not seeing a greening, there is a couple uh, viruses and roses that will give us the exact same patterning, uh, pattern and uh, coloration called rose mosaic. I don't wanna go that path at this point in time fertilize, reassess, and if you have a problem, get a hold of us again here in about a month or two. All right, thank you, Amy. This is a Lincoln viewer, Elizabeth. Uh, she has Annabelle hydrangeas, four, same area, last three years. One has a lot of curling in the foliage, but continues to have new growth. Um, she's wondering, is this frost, is this herbicide, and what do we recommend on that? Based upon the pattern of where the infection is, it looks like it could potentially be herbicide injury, um, especially where the cupping, curling, and distortion is upward, and it's on the newest, most, most growth. Um, that's where we commonly see those broadleaf weed killers like 2,4-D um, getting into that plant. And so that would be my first thought is it could potentially be that 2,4-D um, like herbicide injury. Now what can you do? Nothing at this point in time. Um, is the plant gonna be harmed? Is it gonna live long term? Again, we're just gonna have to wait and see. It looks like it just potentially got a little whiff. Um, so it is could potentially grow out of it. Now it's just gonna be a waiting game to see what happens. Make sure that it has adequate amount of moisture. Um, just be careful when we do those 2,4-D like herbicides that we're not doing it in the heat of the day um, where it's gonna volatize and, and go into the air and ding our nearby plant material. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, as you can see, we are surrounded by this beautiful park. For our first segment, let's take a look at the history behind Harmon Park and visit a little bit of the beauty of the garden. Harmon Park has, has, a, has a great history. It was established in 1876. Um, it was originally the kind of the south end of this property, and it was called Third Ward Park. Um, in the late 20s, 30s, uh, the city of Kearney received a grant from the Harmon Foundation. We were one of 50 cities out of about 800 that received this grant, so it was a pretty big deal. And the grant was out in New York, and uh, so that kind of helped establish the growth of the park. And um, at that time, it was renamed Harmon Park. Um, but yeah, there was a time where we had monkey cages and pony rides and croquet courts and so this park has seen a lot of different things but uh, the rock garden area that I'm standing in now in Harmon Pool were WPA project as was the sanatorium. The rock garden was built between 36 to 1940 and um, rocks were brought in from near the Franklin area and from various states. Wyoming I think brought in a lot of rocks and uh, people were asked to bring in rocks when they went on vacation. And uh, so that actually, so it was definitely community driven. In fact, we have a, have a little pyramid over there that's uh, said to have a rock from all 50 states as well. The rock I'm sitting on, legend has it, fell off of the cart as they were traveling with it up the hill. They were not able to move it, lift it, or get it back into the cart. So being somewhat innovative Works Progress Administration workers, they tunneled under it for the stream. And much like it still is today, the stream flows under this three to six ton boulder. In 1990, we did a major renovation of the rock garden and had a master plan uh, commissioned that involved mostly perennials. Perennials don't live forever, but they live much longer than annuals. And if you can imagine replanting an area this size every year, versus replanting some of the perennials each year. It's, it's been a real labor saver for us. Well, that renovation was uh, somewhat controversial in the number of some of the, what we would call weed trees that had to be removed to open up this area for security and for aesthetics and so on. 
Uh, once we had that done, we've continued to replant and we replant a few each year so we stagger the age of the, the tree uh, stand. And we also try to be very vigorous in our mixture and diversity of species so we don't have, for instance, all green ash trees up here that we're gonna lose when the emerald ash borer gets here. We've got a great diversity of trees. We do have a few ash trees and we'll have to deal with which ones to treat and which ones to remove. But basically the diversity, that's a good example of why uh, it just it makes it more attractive as well and there probably are between 50 and 80 species of trees in the rock garden and surrounding area. So yeah, we have a great city staff, a great city park staff that maintain this park. Um, we also have what's called, this is a sort of a unique line of employment called the Rock Garden Rangers. And we've had this in place for probably about the last 20 to 30 years. And they're specifically 15 and 16 year olds. Um, and this is their main area. It's, it's pulling weeds, it's mulching, it's planting flowers. Uh, they do work in other parks and other sections, but this is their number one location because it, it does take a, a fair amount of man hours to keep it looking nice. And, uh, and uh, again, it's so valued, we wanna make it look top notch. Um, it's imperfections is what makes it perfect. Um, the rocks and how they were placed back in the 30s, uh, you know, most everything's still original out here. I mean, we've had to do some repairs and some certain things, but we've always tried to keep with the character. And again, just to have somebody that had the vision to carry this out in this piece of property. And uh, it's just a peaceful place right in the middle of the city. It's almost like it's our central park. You know, we really are having a great time with our audience and in this beautiful place, the sound of the water, the birds, the breeze, the perfect weather. I think we might come back to Kearney if we're asked. A little bit nicer weather than uh, <laughs> during last year. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Dennis, you get the next picture question. Okay. Um, I don't recall where this uh, comes from. I'm not sure she told us, but she wanted to know okay, what this is. that's a spade foot. It's not a spade okay. foot toad. It's a spade foot. It's a type of frog. Um, I, I think they're great. They have no teeth and they eat insects. They carry no germs and viruses and they dig down because they have little cornified things on their back feet. And so they dig backwards in the sand. And then when you have a thunderstorm, they come up, mate, lay their eggs and then go back down. So they feed all in one week. And you can hear them right now because they're mating because we just had thunderstorms out here. And I heard them last night and their call, the male's call is quite distinctive. It's bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a spade fish, the abomifrons. And, and I'm certain they make the same face when they do yeah. that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, you can't follow that very well, Bill, but let's give it a no. shot. <laughs> this, is a, this is a Midtown Omaha okay. viewer. Uh, their lawn is a mix of zoysia and fescue. The zoysia has usually greened up. Yep. This year it's quite delayed, spots and strips that are still brown. What's going on? You know, it could be natural. We had a a drier winter, it wasn't terrible. Um, you know, the Bermuda grass and the zoysia grass plots we have on East Campus are just starting to green up. And so um, this is maybe not that atypical uh, after the winter we had. If it stays like that, then it could be dead. It will slowly fill in with the heat that's going on right now. Um, and this is the most, one of the problems we have when we have a zoysia grass lawn next to a cool season grass lawn is that, that asymmetric kind of green up. So if you're trying to control the zoysia grass, um, you know, you're kind of limited to non-selective options or a couple of different specialty type herbicides, means a trione and, uh, and this new one, uh, Pylex, um, that can control it. And if you're gonna go that route, you wanna get it as soon as the grass does start to green up, then it's, it's weakened after the winter and that's where you're gonna get the best level of control. You don't wanna wait till the fall with those applications. Um, so this is kind of one of those challenges that you're gonna pick. Do you want the zoysia? Do you want the cool season grass? And then you can kind of figure out your management plan as a result of that. All right, and what if you want them both? You want them both, then you just gotta be patient and uh, fertilize and that zoysia should green up and, and start to recover and hopefully it's not winter killed. All right, thanks yeah. Bill. Okay, Amy, we actually had a similar question last uh, week, but it was, we think insect related. Okay. Uh, this is a viewer that has Schubert cherry in an open area. Uh, noticed holes appeared in the leaves, most of the leaves dropped. Identified a shot hole, did a fungicide uh, and used daconil with chlorothalonil in it. Mm -hmm. And it wonders what he can do uh, to control it so it doesn't happen again. Okay, looking at the pictures, it really is shot hole, which is a fungal disease common in the spring and you're using the right product. Chlorothalonil is probably one of the best products on the market for shot hole. 
But the big question is, why do I still have it? And the main reason is because of the storms and the rains that we have this spring. Chlorothalonil is what we call a contact product. So it only works on the surface of the plant. And whenever we get a rain event, it washes it off. So you have to come right back right after that rain event to reapply the product to provide protection. Now, if you read the label, the label is going to tell you reapply every 7 to 14 days or 10 days in there. So you're in a catch-22. According to the label, which is a law, it says every 7 to 14 days. If I look at the product and it's a contact, that means I should spray after every rain event that I have. So we're probably looking at a situation you're following the rules following that label correctly but mother nature wasn't cooperating with you and so you made the application it rained off it washed off and then the spores still were able to attack the tree and cause these spot uh, shot holes to occur what do we do next year continue doing the exact same program that you're doing currently and cross your fingers that you're not going to get those constant rain events that's going to continually continuously wash your product off the plant all right thank you amy Elizabeth, this is a question from uh, an 82-year-old Iowa viewer. So shout out to Iowa and all of us old women. And <laughs> she has some boxwoods that have done this. And she's in Exira, Iowa, which is kind of middle, middle west. She has had difficulty keeping them alive. Um, she's wondering about nematodes, small plants. Anything you can tell from the pictures, um, they did turn this color this winter, the whole thing. And that's that indication that we're looking for, is when they turn that color over the winter, we're probably looking at winter desiccation. And unfortunately, boxwoods are really, really prone to that winter desiccation. What happens with that is the roots are not able to soak up enough moisture that gets lost by the leaf. And so that's where that leaf is gonna lose a lot of moisture, it's gonna turn that tan color. Now what can you do? Um, you need to make sure that they're placed properly in the landscape, so make sure that they're put in a, in a location where they're not gonna get that hot, hot sun and, and lose a lot of moisture. If they're put on a north or even a west facing um, area, know that those winter winds are probably gonna dry them out. So make sure that you apply moisture anytime air temps are 40 degrees or more, give it a slow soak, allow it to, to infiltrate down um, before the temperatures drop below 32 degrees where it's going to freeze. The other kicker is you can apply an anti-desiccant. It's like a waxy-like product. You can apply that and it kind of slows the moisture loss through the leaves. You're looking at a couple of different applications during that. I'm not a big fan of boxwoods by any means because they smell like cat pee to me when they bloom. Um, but if you really like them, you know, those are some of the things you're going to have to keep in mind with those boxwoods is you're going to have to make sure that they have adequate moisture when we go throughout the winter. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. A, a good, a good scent. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we got all of our ornamentals and our vegetables planted in our backyard farmer garden last week. So let's take a minute and look at the other ends of this beautiful space. This is the backyard farmer garden this week. Our backyard farmer garden is actually a part of a larger series of gardens that we do talk about on occasion. So this week, let's take a look at the Vasco garden, which is older, and it's the perennials at the top of the hill and a handful of shrubs. We have a, a, some work to do with adding additional plants into that garden, and we're looking at a little bit of winter kill, but it is really constant in our backyard farmer garden arrangement. We also have the rain chain, and we are going into year three on the rain chain, which still performs its function beautifully. We had a little bit of winter damage on some of those perennial plants in this series of rain chain gardens, but again, they are beautiful, they are seasonal, they will begin to rise and do their thing and attract all those pollinators, which is of course essential in all of our gardens so that our vegetables and our fruits can be pollinated, our insects need to eat as well. We have some beautiful perennial plants that are well established as a part of both entrances and exits to the entire garden. And one of those is this great Baptisia. And that's what ha is happening this week in the Backyard Farmer Garden. You know, the Yavasco Garden really does predate the rest of it. It's perennial, it's pretty solid, and the rain chain is doing exactly what it should do. So this is a wonderful place for all of you to visit when you come to Lincoln. All right, uh, Dennis, we're gonna go to regular old questions. Okay. This is pretty cool. This is a person who has a wild turkey that has had 
eight babies in the backyard and she is wondering does she put a fence around the yard to keep the turkeys in, the dogs, the kids, the cats out or what exactly can, can and should she do? Well, if they're wild turkeys, a uh, fence probably won't work because they can get enough light to get over most fence. So if you want to keep them, um, you know, keep the kids away from them, um, a fence, you know, can keep the kids away, uh, keep the dogs away, uh, would be your best bet. And uh, wait to turkey season, and then you'll have something for Thanksgiving. <laughs> a lot so. of something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bill, um, this is a question about corn gluten meal. Okay. He has used it in the spring to fertilize and suppress crabgrass. Sure. And he is wondering, really, does it work? And has there been any follow-up to the, uh, the Iowa State research on it? Sure. The initial stuff, research in Iowa State showed that the corn gluten meal would, would help with, with crabgrass. But then when we looked at it in even more detail, what we've noticed is that there's a amount of nitrogen fertilizer in that corn gluten meal that the grass just grows very vigorously because it's very well fertilized and a well fertilized lawn, like I showed in my sample, is going to help to suppress those weeds. And so, um, you know, it can work as a fertilizer source, but you can use other just types of fertilizer to keep that lawn vigorous that will also really suppress that crabgrass. It's once that cool season grasses start getting stressed out by the heat and are not fertilized well, that then the crabgrass comes in and it shows its, uh, its ugly head in July. So can be effective, but so can a lot of the fertilizer products. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, Amy, this is a hackberry question. Mm -hmm. We've been having a lot of questions about big hackberries dropping yellow leaves all over everything. The question is whether it is, in fact, a disease of hackberry or whether it is drought stress. What is going on exactly? Okay. Typically with hackberry, we don't see a lot of disease issues with hackberries. So I'm going to probably lean to a more an environmental condition, whether it was the cool temperatures and we had a late, you know, that nipping of the buds, uh, late frost type situation where we should be seeing a second flush. It could be associated with the drought back in 12 and 13. Trees are amazing. They can handle a lot of stress, but we don't actually see that stress for multiple years down the road. So we're five years since the drought and we're still seeing the impacts. And some of our trees, this is the first time we're gonna see the impact of the drought of 12 and 13, which is amazing. So um, it's one of those things you're gonna to have to sit back, assess the tree, um, do not fertilize it. That actually adds more stress to the tree. Make sure it's getting adequate water as we get into these hot summer months and see what happens and uh, maybe it'll be just fine next year. All right, thanks Amy. And Elizabeth, you're nodding like you're getting the same question. We're getting a lot of those questions too and it's exactly what Amy said. So All don't right. be worried, it'll be okay. <laughs> All right, and your question is whether the strawberry bed will be okay. Um, Cass County viewer, overrun with bindweed this year. They're gonna pick off the number of strawberries that they can and then they're gonna tear the bed up. They want to know what they should do to actually restore that site before they reestablish the strawberries. You know, the, the kicker with bindweed, it's one of those tough weeds that you want to get rid of, but it always pops back. Um, it's a perennial, so it's going to come up from the root system. So, I mean, if you're picking your strawberries off now, you might want to consider solarizing that area to try to kill the, the root system and to kill any seeds that are potentially there, or anything along those lines. You might want to look at that solarization. Um, there are some products you can apply. They're going to be um, ones that you're going to have to reapply on a regular basis. So because we haven't gotten into the heat of the summer yet, I'd possibly take a look at that solarization. Um, that's going to help you for a while. My guess is, is you're still going to continue to get bindweed on a regular basis just because it's, a, it's one of those weeds that we're always going to be fighting in the some spots. The cool thing about that actually is uh, the herbicide that we can use to kill uh, crabgrass actually kills bindweed. Quincroac, okay. so just use that in my yard a lot. It, it works pretty well, so. So if you didn't hear that, that was quinclorac. Yep, yep. Right? Yep, commercially drive, it's in that roundup for lawns too, but that that's kills crabgrass and it also kills bindweed, which is kind of weird because you have a grass and a non-grass, so. Perfect, awesome, thanks, Bill. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. Coming up later in the show, Elizabeth is going to show us some new trees at Raising Nebraska at State Fair in Grand Island. Right now, it is time for the plants of the week, which she did manage to pick back up after she dropped them. 
I spilled them all over. <laughs> so there's no water in this face right now. Um, so what we have is we have some really fun and cool samples. This uh, more lavendery purple kind of one with the funky flowers is Monarda or Bee Balm. Um, this is the Bradbury one. And the cool part about this one is the native and it's going to bloom earlier than most of the other ones. So that's a cool one. But the big kicker on this one is it's resistant to powdery mildew. And why is that a big deal? Well, a lot of these Monardas get powdery mildew and those leaves get that powdery kind of ghostly appearance to them um, and then sometimes they, they look really sick but with the powdery mildew resistant one you don't have to worry about applying that fungicide to them to to prevent that or to cure that um, the seed heads are kind of cool they just look like these little brown balls just sitting on there um, and so they help to spread that way um, through its seeds the other one that we have is going to be the fontanelle iris um, the cool part about the iris is we know that the foliage or the flowers are going to fade eventually, um, so we need to take a look at the foliage. And this is one of the ones where it has really great strong foliage with it as well. Um, so that's the cool one. You know, how can you mistake that lovely iris flower? Um, and if you want, once that one fades, you know, we've got another one coming right behind it that we can pick this one off and let that other one go ahead and bloom there too. These are great near the edges of rain gardens and out here at Harmon Park, we have a whole bunch of irises. The thing to keep in mind is that yellow iris can be slightly aggressive. So when you're looking, you need to make sure that you're not picking one of those iris varieties that's gonna be aggressive long-term. All right, thank you, Elizabeth Buchis. And those are in the Backyard Farmer Garden. <laughs> all right, you get a series of pictures next, Dennis. These are all critter damage pictures. The first is, um, a, a, a patch that was <laughs> robust and healthy of rhubarb looked robust and healthy, as she said, and I said, and her suspects are groundhogs, rabbits, and deer. What happened? And the second one is a, an, a maple on an acreage, variegated. It's uh, one tree that's been chawed on. And the third one is uh, a, a maple tree that also has been chawed on. Okay. Well, there's two different creatures here um, for the three instances. The first one, the rhubarb, is not rabbits or woodchucks or groundhogs. It looks more like a raccoon going in there after something. Raccoons do eat sometimes rhubarb, one of the few animals that do. But also deer occasionally will try rhubarb. And the way it's stomped and really smashed, I would go more with either a raccoon or a deer. Um, it's hard to tell without seeing the teeth marks. The other two are definitely tree squirrels, fox squirrels. And the fox squirrels will strip, uh, chew and strip and lick uh, to get nutrients. Uh, for those, you need to protect that part of the tree, the bottom part of the tree, maybe so it's an inch bigger, maybe some type of uh, drain tile. Or you can use a repellent. You can also use um, vegetable oil mixed with cayenne pepper. So the first time the squirrel chews, it'll burn itself and won't hurt the squirrel permanently, but the squirrel won't come back to that, that tree. People will say, how hot should you make it? You taste it, if it's too hot for you, it's too hot for the squirrel. It's the easiest <laughs> way to do it. And I misspoke, that third one was actually an elm, so apparently the squirrels don't Oh, they care. love elms, they love elms. All right. Yep. A, lot of, a lot of sugar and, and starch in, behind the bark. So. All right. Yeah. Okay, so Bill, you actually have trees, but they're turf questions. Yeah, trees and turf, right? Yeah, this is a, a maple root issue, mm -hmm. and he is wondering um, how he can actually kill the turf around that tree so he doesn't continue to do mower blight damage on the roots because the roots are above ground. And then yeah. the second, I believe, is also mower blight on the tree. So what yeah. do we recommend so we, here? So, something we have to be careful with with all of our mowers and our our uh, string trimmers, or my mom calls them weed whackers, you know, it's, um, and you have the grass going right up to the tree like that, you're really damaging the tree, you're, you're reducing its, its uh, potential to live a long, normal, healthy life. And so we like to try to have a nice mulch bed area around the tree. Um, you know, killing that turf off isn't really difficult to do. Um, we be careful with any kind of mechanical digging because you don't want to dig into the, the vasculature of those roots. And so, uh, maybe some kind of a non-selective herbicide would be a nice way to try to kill off that area. Um, and then I just mulch over the top of it. I'd be kind of reluctant, I would think, to do any kind of solarization because I wouldn't want to heat up around that, that tree, right? So I think that, that would probably make the most sense to go with that non-selective type of a product. Uh, 
And just keeping in mind about drift and things when you're making these applications on warm summer days too. All right, anything you can do to keep those mowers away from those trunks and roots. Yeah, and just, you know, bigger the better. Um, you know, this looks nice too. It does look nice. Thank you, I don't know. guy. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> All right, Amy, you have a couple of different pictures from a couple of different viewers. Mm -hmm. This first one has a lovely white thing in the foreground and then some other little things popping up in the background. And the second one is just a big old white thing. What do this we have going hole. on? So if you really take a look at these pictures, these are all occurring in landscape beds where we have mulch down. And the last one, this is a slime mold. The other white glob is another slime mold. These are fungi that are breaking down the mulch. They're good guys. So they're breaking that mulch down into carbon and nitrogen that the plants can actually uptake and use. They don't look pleasant. Um, some of them also are called dog vomit fungi. Not real pleasant to look at. The trick is they're short-lived. They're only that color for maybe a day or two. If you really don't like them, hit them with a strong blast of water and you'll wash them right off. On that first picture, if you look further back, there's mushrooms that are just coming up. Now, the type of mushroom these are, I'm not for sure, but once again, they're breaking down the dead organic matter, whether it's the wood chips or they could be breaking down tree roots that might have been underneath that bed at one point in time that are now gone. They're breaking down, and this is the reproduction structure of that fungus, breaking down those roots. That's how it's gonna spread from point A to point B. Once again, they're short-lived. If you don't like them, you could go cut them off or if they're in your home lawn, just hit them with the mower and you're good to go. So in bottom line, they're actually good guys. We want them, they're helping our plants, they're giving us the carbon and nitrogen that we need for our plants to be nice and healthy. Just don't nibble. Yeah, don't nibble any of them. They'll make you feel pretty ucky later on. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, uh, you have a Tecumseh viewer who has sent images of stunted potato plants. 10, um, whoops. I gave the wrong picture. This is Bill's tree, isn't it? It's my tree. So this is Bill's tree, which is actually a lovely autumn blaze maple. Kim's and favorite. The, and the question on this one is, the roots are up, the tree is going down, what to do, right? Right, and Bill showed me this picture a couple weeks ago yep. when I was at his office um, getting ready for Backyard Farmer, and so I got a little chance to look at it. Now, the, the issue with this tree is you start to notice that the canopy is starting to thin out. And that's your red flag right now. The canopy shouldn't be that thin, especially on an autumn blaze. That's a quick growing kind of a tree. So we took a look at the root system and the root system has all sorts of stem girdling roots that are crossing on top of them. And it's just kind of like kinking a hose. When you have that stem and then you have that root going over the top of it, it's like kinking a hose. And my guess is, is we have a whole lot of root issues going on underneath the ground that we just can't see. And so long-term, um, outlook for this tree is not very positive. Um, because it's a maple, once those limbs die, we would talk about removal as quickly as possible because they're very brittle. Um, if we have a hazard or something for them to fall on, that's gonna be another thing. Now, if it was me, I would maybe take a look at removing it quicker sooner rather than later, I guess. I think I'm planning on taking a chainsaw to the base. A chainsaw <laughs> to the base. It's not where I wanted it. I felt bad while taking this big tree down, but now that nature's kind of doing it for me, I don't feel as bad. So that's going to be the next backyard farmer, maybe. Uh, <laughs> chainsaw <laughs> to the base. Guy, taking so. a tree down. Um, the thing to keep in mind is you're probably going to want to treat that stump with a cut stump treatment with a glyphosate-like product or something along those lines. Um, some trees are really prone to sending suckers up from the root system or, or from the base. And so by cutting that tree and immediately applying that Roundup-like product or the glyphosate product around the cambium area right behind the bark um, is going to help to kill that root system so you don't have all those little ones popping up all over your yard because we know turf is kind of important to Bill. <laughs> kind of, on a good day. And that's a pretty good segue from tree segment into all of the real good new trees that Elizabeth is planting at Raising Nebraska. Let's take a few minutes to see what she's done. We're out here at the Family Fun Zone in Bonner Park in Grand Island, Nebraska, and we planted a bunch of trees last October. We planted these trees for several reasons. First, we're getting ready for emerald ash borer to hit the center part of the state. Two, we're adding species diversity. And three, we increased our wildlife diversity by adding lots of different trees and shrubs. So we've planted them. They are growing great. They're looking good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the ones that are doing extremely well for our area and some of the ones that might not do real well. 
One of the plants that we installed out here was the American sycamore. And this tree, we put it right in this location because it really likes it wet. It can handle those intermittent wet and dry types of conditions that we have out here in this drainage swale. One of the other reasons we put it back here is because it's going to be a very large shade tree with time. And it's going to help to provide shade for all the fair goers as the years go on. The other plant material that we installed out here was not only for species diversity, but it was also installed for wildlife. So what we have is we have several different viburnums, like the viburnum dentatum, like we have right here, that's not only gonna flower, but it's also gonna uh, have persistent fruit that birds are gonna be able to eat. Just like the sycamore, the swamp white oak can also handle those intermittent wet and dry types of conditions that we have out here at Funner Park. What we have is we've got the swamp white oak is going to provide a lot of shade for some of the vendors that park near the sidewalk. Some of the plants that we installed last fall didn't fare so well over the winter. The Sun Valley maple, we tried to make it limp along. We didn't have a good sample when we installed it. Um, so this is just a good example of you need to have quality nursery stock. This guy was really root bound when we installed him and we thought maybe we could make him work in this site. But as you can see, this spring, uh, he didn't fare quite so well. Diversity is really important, whether it's your home landscape or in a large public landscape out here at Fauner Park. So when we install our trees, we need to make sure that we start with good nursery stock. We need to make sure that they're well watered and we shoot for about an inch of supplemental water a week uh, when we get through the growing season. We also need to make sure that we use species diversity. So we need to install those different shrubs, whether it's the viburnums for the birds, whether it's the willows that will work in the wet areas, or our lovely shade trees like our oak or our sycamore that'll provide shade for years to come. You know, diversity in the landscape, as Elizabeth said, is really, really important. It will be great to watch what lives and what dies under your wonderful, watchful eyes. <laughs> All right. Last picture for you. Okay. This is another, of course, critter. And uh, she had a walnut that went from foliated to stick overnight. Uh, the follow-up question was, did you see any insects? What exactly? And she said within a week, it actually has started putting new growth on again. What do you think here, Dennis? It looks like it's been browsed, and the thing that browses would be deer. And that could be either whitetail, mule deer, or even if they're in the extreme uh, northwest part of the state, it could even be elk, but it doesn't look like an area for elk. So I, it's, it's going to be deer. Deer are browsers, and they'll reach pretty far up to, uh, and they don't, walnuts aren't on their best list, but if it's tender and has a nutty flavor, um, they would go for it. They would, they, the deer would really like it. So it's deer, so it would be difficult. There's fewer repellents that work with deer. There's some new devices out that you can put in that have batteries in them, and you put a deer uh, attractant in these little prongs that are like this, and the deer puts his nose to that to smell it, and it shocks the deer, doesn't hurt the deer permanently, and the deer will associate that area with the shock and probably stay away from that. So there are little shocking devices, and you can make them as high or low as you want, and they work fairly well. And those are available online? I've seen them online, but I think some of the larger nursery centers may have them as well. All right, excellent. Thank you, Dennis. All right, Bill, <clears throat> this is a viewer that uh, these lawns are a part of a townhome association, so it's probably managed, you know, all of a piece. Pictures are taken from the same spot in this turf, south, north, uh, mowed and treated chemically, and he's wondering about the streaking or the funny different colors showing up in this lawn. Yeah, when I see this, um, you know, I'm thinking something to do with the mower. Is the mower being set right? Are they mowing too fast? There's a lot to mowing more than just going out and mowing. Um, uh, and so making sure that sometimes they, when people change or sharpen the blade, is it sharp? If it is sharp and they was recently put on, Sometimes people mix, mix them up and they put them upside down. I've seen that happen before. Um, are they mowing too fast? And so there could be something, when you see obvious streaks like this, we think um, not a plant pathogen, we think it's something to do with, uh, with you know, people because we like to make straight lines and pathogens don't make straight lines. It could be that ascochyta uh, leaf blight though because we did see if it had some drought stress and then we mowed over the top, we'd see those mower damage after that. Um, but it doesn't look as, uh, as obvious as that first set of pictures I had to start the show off today. So 
check with your mower first to make sure everything is set properly because based on everything else you've said, you know, we shouldn't be seeing these types of streaking. And if, and if it continues, send us another picture and we'll do some follow-up. And yeah, I had definitely. something along those lines in my lawn. What I did is I accidentally spilled gasoline when I was filling it on the back tire and I got a nice brown streak. Yep. So if you want That'll brown streaks, just put gasoline on the tires and go for it. <laughs> do not listen to the, the critter guy about turf. No, <laughs> no don't do it. <laughs> All right, Amy, uh, this is a viewer with asters. They're in northwest Iowa, mm -hmm. um, south facing some shade from a tree. They're showing these purple spots, and there is a weed in the same vicinity showing the same spots. Now, whether it's a weedy aster or she didn't send us a picture of that, but okay, what is it? By looking at it, it it's it's a fungal disease. I would lean toward a Cercospora type species. Um, it's because of the wet conditions. Now, the weed that has it, I would probably lean toward it's another aster species. If it's a different species, uh, maybe a totally different disease. Diseases get a little picky about plant species and they don't like to jump species whatsoever so the trick is it likes wet weather which we've been having now that we're getting warm and dry I would probably see that fungal leaf spot slow down I'm not going to rent recommend any recommendation for treatment at this point in time um, your aster still should bloom with no problems later on this summer and you should be good to go for next year Excellent. The nice thing about it is it's leaf spot, not flower spot. Correct. <laughs> All right. Now the potato picture. Elizabeth, this is Tecumseh. Uh, stunted potatoes, about 10 in the middle of the row. Um, root appears fine. The cut piece appears fine. They did preen all four rows after planting. Any idea why we'd have 10 in the middle of the row that would do this odd thing? You know, my first thought is when you've got 10 in the middle of the row, how, you know, could it be viral? because we've got that distortion and that little bit of clubbing. Um, could it be viral? Because then if we've got 10 in a row, how many pieces did we cut that seed potato into? Because if that seed potato had a virus and we cut it and then we spread it out, we're going to see that in those issues. Now, if it continues to grow and it grows out of it, we could be looking at herbicide injury. And herbicide injury, like those 240-like products, um, are going to cause cupping, curling distortion, mainly on those uppermost tender pieces. Um, as that potato continues to grow, though, it's going to start to grow out of it, hopefully, if it didn't get a big enough whiff. Um, and then you're going to start to notice it looking normal. Now, the kicker with when we get into herbicide injury on vegetables or fruits, there is no pre-harvest interval from when it's applied to when we can safely consume that product. And so if it is herbicide, we like to recommend that you destroy um, or not eat from that plant. Now, it can be hard to do, so at least remove those fruits that were, at, that were there at the time of the application. Um, but like I said, because there's no pre-harvest interval, there's nothing on there that says when it's safe to go ahead and consume that. So with these potatoes, just continue to watch them, see what happens, um, and then if they grow out of it, we could be looking at herbicide. All right. I, will, I will state if it doesn't grow out of it and it is the viruses, remove them immediately because most of those potato viruses are transmitted by leaf hoppers, so it's going to keep going down your row. So if the new growth doesn't look good, rip them out. <laughs> All right, perfect. And do not throw them in the compost pile. Do not throw them in the compost. Okay, thanks. All right, regular old questions. Dennis, um, this viewer wants to know if poison gummy worms can be used safely in a vegetable garden because the moles have become a problem. And then he's wondering if the poison would affect the consumption of the produce if they've used these in the vegetable garden. Okay, I believe the gummy worms, which is usually tomcat for moles or talpa rid, I believe the label does not allow you to use them in non-turf areas. So you always go by the label and I'm fairly sure they don't want you to do that. The other thing, moles usually don't cause that much of a problem um, because they're only eating insects and earthworms. They're not hurting turf roots. They break the turf roots, but they're not feeding on them. And so if you have something as a tap root or hard roots, they're pretty much just, you know, aerating and eating the insects and primarily earthworms in between your vegetables. So I would not worry about it too much, but I definitely would not use a toxicant for moles. Because remember, moles are a mammal, we're a mammal. So definitely don't use a toxicant for moles in a vegetable garden. All right, thanks. All right, Bill, this is, um, this is if you were trying to describe something that's been happening for several years without sending a picture. Okay. It says the bluegrass looks good in the spring with increasing temperatures. 
spots brown, pie plate size, and then other areas appear dry even with watering. Yep. So 20 to 30% damage, spray, granules, fungicide, Sure. What do we do here? So uh, my guess, if it's, if I think it's a bluegrass lawn. Um, if we see it, it looks good in the spring and then dies out. It could be annual bluegrass, which if it is, you'd see a lot of seed heads that would have just kind of ended their flush in May. Um, the more likely one is rough bluegrass. Um, it loves cool, wet weather. It hates hot, um, dry weather. If it is rough bluegrass, it's very stoloniferous, and so you can actually go down to that grass and pull it up like you're pulling off a toupee, like it just comes right up, right? So uh, if you have that, then you want to round that area up and you want to uh, seed uh, some new bluegrass into that. Uh, are things to look for? Is your soil, is it, is it hydrophobic or not? It means if you put water onto it, is the water moving into the soil and moving off? Um, more than likely, if it's a, a more clay soil, it's probably not that issue. Um, so I will just look to identify that grass first, make sure it is Kentucky bluegrass. All right, thanks, Bill. Amy, this may or may not be disease, but this is a, uh, an Omaha viewer with peonies. They've lived there 15 years. What they have is they had the, the flowers themselves all of a sudden had brown edges, brown spots, and just kind of went like this. And they're wondering, is this disease or is this our odd weather we've been having? It's definitely a disease that whoop, it's called a shepherd's hook because it looks like a shepherd's hook once that peony bud dies. And what you're dealing with is botrytis blight. It is a common fungal disease that we'll see in peonies, roses, flocks, you name it, we can find botrytis blight anywhere. Um, it's going to attack those buds and those petals and with the wet weather that is the prime time for it to attack. So how do we manage it? The minute those buds start to set on, you start with a fungicide application and you keep applying until your, your peonies are done and are spent out and you're ready to move on to the next uh, flower in your landscape. Now, but try to spite on roses, you would also have to continue on throughout the growing season for that. Um, common, we see it everywhere. Wet weather, once we get dry, we don't have an issue. The other trick I will tell you, avoid overhead irrigation because that's going to favor botrytis blight, something fierce in those peonies and roses. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a viewer who has a lilac, a, quite an old one. They have a lot of canes, maybe a dozen that are two or three inches. No foliage up the canes <clears throat> and a lot of suckers at the base. He's wondering how, how he should manage that so he can save the lilac and, and get it to bloom properly. The kicker with some of those lilacs when they get to that size and they get those big canes on them is they're more attractive to the ash lilac borer. Um, so you really want to remove those older, bigger canes. Now we'd like to do it where you remove one third of the cane, so over three years you've <coughs> completely rejuvenated that shrub. The kicker is, is that's easier said than done, especially when you're dealing with those well-established, really big, old-fashioned lilacs. So you might have to consider complete rejuvenation where you cut it back completely uh, before it leaves out. Now the kicker is, is you're gonna miss out on that flower production that year. But if you've got those larger canes and you're not able to get the chainsaw or the saw in there to remove one third of the canes over that three year time span, it's gonna be easier just to take the chainsaw, cut it back, um, and then let the tree or the shrub start over again. So they will get blooms eventually, it's just gonna take a few years. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Okay, Dennis, this is a, a, a rabbit question and comment. Okay. We had two or three people send in pictures of the hole dug in the form. turf, yes. the form, right? It didn't see the baby bunnies. And then we had a, a viewer who said about 30 years ago for Festival of Color, someone said lay a plastic, so clear plastic bottle down three quarters filled with water along the path in the flowers in the garden. The bunnies will run by, right by and will not stop to sample. And she's tried it and her neighbor has tried it. So rabbits just keep heading down the bunny trail. What is going on with that one? That's a good one. I would like to see, you know, we, maybe we can get a grad student to do that into a proper, you know, 100 uh, trials to see what's happening there. It could be reflection off the water, that the sun is reflecting through the water and, and they're getting scared of something. Other than that, uh, I'm not sure. All right, so um, there we go with a good graduate student project. Yep. Yep. 
All right. Well, and unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer tonight. We want to say thanks to our audience for joining us in beautiful Harmon Park. Thanks to Steinbrink Landscape, Rocky, for all the beautiful plants that are hiding all the things that we don't want you to see. Thanks, of course, to NET for putting this production on. And thanks to our panel for another great show.